Professor Sullivan, yeah. first, Christian Scow and myself want to congratulate you on being awarded the Abel Prize for 2022 for your groundbreaking contributions to topology in its broadest sense, and in particular, al its algebraic, geometric, and dynamical aspects. You will receive the Arbel Prize from His Majesty the King of Norway tomorrow. Thank you. You've worked in very many different fields, and actually your uh, supervisor uh, say that you're some sort of intellectual vacuum cleaner. Uh, but it seems that you've always had a guiding principle, a theme of what you're doing. So if mathematics is divided in, on two pillars, space and numbers, you've been partial to space, actually to the extent that you want to replace numbers by space. Uh, and at the heart of this uh, quest of yours, you have the question, what is a manifold? And uh, actually perhaps that's a good place to start. So before we start on your journey from, as you say, the outside to the inside, um, perhaps intuitively, what, what is a manifold? Space. And it's a space, but it's a sort of a special space, isn't it? No. Well, the idea of space is, you know, you can move things around and there's nothing, you, there's not an invisible wall that makes you stop mm. here, you move it around. And any space which is locally like that is called a manifold. Mm. So that's the general, but it's a mathematical space itself is a intuitive word that we all know about, but there's an actual concept called manifold, mm -hmm. uh, which sort of is the logical version of that intuitive concept. Mm. Yeah, and then it's attractive notion when you first learn about it as a math student, and the first math theory about these manifolds that I learned about was sort of strange. Mm -hmm. Tell me. It was like you attach to this object, which you didn't really describe, some other objects, which were very abstract and part of algebraic topology. Okay. And then if you had enough of those with the right conditions, you could build a manifold. So you could actually reconstruct the manifold. You could build from it up data. to equivalence, mm -hmm. you know, but you didn't really construct the points of the manifold mm -hmm. in a canonical way. It's like it has no points. It was like a black box. The okay. information is stored there. Mm -hmm. And that is where number comes in. All those concepts are based on numbers, the algebra. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and whereas the actual texture of space is not there. So we, is it like uh, the recipe for a cake versus the cake? Yeah, I would say it's exactly like that. Mm -hmm. It's a good idea, right? You must have prepared that. <laughs> no, actually <laughs> not. <laughs> it's very good. <laughs> no, that's a good interpretation, mm -hmm. right? But like, you really want to It's to like a cake with uh, no edges or layers. It's just this delicious cake mm -hmm. running forever, right? And yeah. you really wanted to get at the cake. Well, I was, you know, that's what you're attracted to, the, uh, the, the idea of space and texture. And then it turned out every time I would ask a professor a question, he gave me an answer that was in terms of this logic of numbers, mm -hmm. which is algebraic topology and homotopy theory. So I had to learn that as it were. Mm -hmm. So I started learning that uh, and adjusted the geometric problems so that they fit with the numbers, exactly. so to speak. And then you could, you know, there, some, some goals are not achievable and some are within reach. And so I adjusted to get the ones within reach mm. during that period, yeah. So, so what you're describing here is is more or less what is called surgery, where you yeah. where you, where you change space so that it fits. Oh, actually, so you build the space according to the prescription. Right. You have a prescription of the information. Uh, you know, it's how many holes it has, how many handles, da da da, and then you build an actual manifold with that description, like mm. you know, thirty three sleeves and mm -mm -mm. you know and you you build it and surgery allows you to build it yeah and then that was a powerful technique which was already a secondary technique following tom cobordism mm -mm -mm. theory which was very influential 
But the important distinction here is, uh, is between what can be deformed and, and pushed and, well, in homotopy theory, in, in a, the homotopy type in technical jargon as opposed to the actual manifold. Right, it was like, uh, yeah, first, it, it, first it's interesting that the classification of closed manifolds is an interesting subject. Mm -hmm. It's not a priori clear that will be so, but it's extremely interesting classifying manifolds that are closed like this, mm -hmm. you know, no boundary, not going off to infinity. So we classically one kno knows the classification for surfaces. That goes back, I mean, Abel and Riemann so the to sphere, figure that out, the donut, the sphere, the, the number of genus, you know, mm -hmm. Abel functions and so on, abelian to differentials, right? Uh, but and that, but already Poincaré discovered in dimension three, it's much more complex, and then it gets more and more as the dimension goes up. And it was kind of interesting that uh, there was enough number machinery, so to speak, mm -hmm. to understand spaces, interestingly enough, of dimensions five and higher. Yeah, that was amazing. That was amazing development, basically due to Tom, I would say, to mm -hmm. start it. Uh, and, and the surgery was completing that story. Mm -hmm. And I got in on the last big boat heading to, heading to the where, wherever, yeah. Exactly, with, yeah. The, with the surgery exact sequence. Right, and and with, with the, uh, Browder, you mentioned Browder. He was, yeah. he, he was presenting this theory, and it was in a kind of a Baroque, complicated <laughs> form, and you could sort of change it around a little bit and get it simpler. And then, if you you could see from the change picture which areas could be developed completely, like mm -mm. the smooth structure is still open in some sense, mm -mm. up to finiteness. I mean, we know all the infinite parts. Yeah, and that is a pre, uh, prior Abel Prize winner. Milner had a huge piece oh, yeah, in that. Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, this leads us to your thesis in Princeton. Princeton must have been a fascinating place oh, to yeah. be. Right. So all these, well, yes, and it yeah, must right, mean they were all influence. there. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's, so you could just ask them. Right, just could, ask them. It, every, every day at tea, you didn't have to make an appointment because they all came to tea. And then you mm -hmm. could ask, you know, how much, how many quarters do you have in your pocket? You could ask anything you wanted to do, right? Uh, there's a cute story about uh, at the, when you're closing in on your thesis, you're having a discussion with Milner. I don't know if you'd care to tell us that. Yeah, well, uh, I had this sequence of steps that if I could do them all, I could solve what I wanted, right? But each step had a clear part and then it had a Milner exotic sphere part. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to sort of, I didn't know how they linked together, so I went to his office, I got him in his office that day. <laughs> and, because uh, I had a serious question, you know. Mm -hmm. The T, you can ask any question, right? But it was serious. So he looked at it and said, why don't you just forget the Milner part? He didn't say it that way. Mm -hmm. Why don't you forget the exotic sphere part and just do the first part? Yeah, so, so this and is this works for piecewise, linear, piecewise differentiable manifolds. Yeah, so those, this is a combinatorial story yeah, as opposed call it to the combinatorial smooth. manifolds or PL manifolds or piecewise differentiable manifolds. But you allow the differentiable structure to break, but you keep the combinatorial structure. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, thank you, Professor Milner. And when I said, I don't like piecewise linear manifolds. I like smooth manifolds. You know? <laughs> and then I thought about, wait a minute. If I do that, I know the... I know the structure completely. Mm -hmm. And now I just have to, I know the local structure and I just have to figure out the global structure, which took another year, but, and then you solve the whole problem, so. And, and, and you ask your thesis advisor, Browder, uh, can this go into my thesis? Yeah, well I had asked him, uh, yeah, that's right. And I asked him, I have this sequence of steps which have these coefficients and if, you, if they're all, you can do all the steps and you get this result. And I said, can that be part of my thesis? And he said, oh, I guess that is your thesis. <laughs> and actually that answered a long-standing question that people had been wondering about, about for quite a while. That is contained in your thesis, is it not? About what? Uh, so uh, about the structure of a combinatorial manifold, so PL manifolds. 
Yeah, I don't mm. think that had been the long, I think you're, are you thinking of the Hauptvermutung? Yeah, I'm thinking about the Hauptvermutung. Oh, no, that's a slight, I mean, it's, that was actually the driving engine. There was this more famous question about whether the combinatorial structure was uniquely determined by the topological structure. Mm -mm -mm. And that was called the Hauptvermutung. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that if, um, whenever I could understand the theory that I was discussing completely, I could use the technique of Novikov mm -hmm. to prove my list of numbers were zero. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as soon as I had enough numbers that solved all the steps, then I could, and the, and the next eight months was like a, a race to see, it wasn't a race against anything, it was just a race against reality. <laughs> uh, every time I could understand this global theory better, mm -hmm. I could prove the Hauptvermutung. And it turns out I could prove everything except one little thing in dimension four had, it wasn't zero, but it had order two. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that was it. Mm -hmm. And then a few years later, they actually found counterexamples in that little pl place there. So yeah, it proved uh, as much as... And that is the obstruction it. group that is, uh, mm -hmm. that is... That is the obstruction group in dimension four. In right, the that's the... Yeah, mm -hmm. right, right. Yeah, so that was... But you yeah, so that was, in a sense, that's not the way I work. I mean, I don't really like, to, I mean, I, you'd love it if you can solve a well-known question, mm -hmm. but I, I really like uh, understanding things better. So mm -hmm. I actually like the theory that says, these are all the piecewise linear manifolds, this, you compute these numbers, and then you know which one you have, and that's a complete discussion. It turns out 99 out of 100 of those numbers are also topological invariants. So it's a corollary. Mm. So people today only know the corollary, and now they even have a simpler proof, so they've forgotten everything I've done. So I'm glad to get this prize, at least I get to talk about it again. <laughs> but, well, but on the other hand, from immediately from there, you move on and do other amazing stuff. You, you, discover, you discover that um, the Galois group has important consequences for the study of manifolds or spaces. Yeah. Uh, and and, you, and you, indeed you solve the famous conjecture that way. Uh, could you take us on that story, focusing on the manifold aspects of it? So, uh, so, so how, how come you have a Galois action on manifolds? It doesn't seem reasonable at all. Galois, right. of course. Right. Yeah. No, it, but that's, I would say, that's still not understood. Mm -hmm. In other words, because there was this list of invariants, mm -hmm. and one of the, I'm simplifying it a little bit, but what, a big part of that list could be collected into one element in K-theory, mm -hmm. you might say. And K-theory has this symmetry, the atoms operations. Mm -hmm. And w one knows that the, like when you look at the roots of unity and the complex numbers, if you add the roots of unity and form that field, that gives you a big piece, it gives you the abelian, abelian part of Galois theory. Mm -hmm. And that symmetry of, of that, those fields, you have to complete it, it's technically a little mm -hmm. strange to topologists, geometers, but when you complete that Galois group, so to speak, it's exactly the abelian part of the big Galois group. Mm -hmm. so Abel, Galois, we have together. And then, and then that symmetry exists in K-theory. So it acted on the invariants. Mm -hmm. So the manifolds were this given information, the homotopy type, and these other numerical invariants. And the Galois group acted on these invariants. Therefore, it acted on the manifolds. Mm -hmm. but, but and so, so, so that's how it came about. It doesn't mm -hmm. come about in a natural way, and that was uh, this Jugendtraum mm -hmm. we, we, we talked about one day, that uh, that means dream of youth, an unrequited Jugendtraum, was to sort of explain this in elementary terms. So that's still open. So, so actually, so, so how can we view manifolds as we would view algebraic varieties in the sort of... Uh, yeah, but that? it's a little strange, you see. Mm -hmm. uh, It's a little strange. I mean, if, if you think of usual algebraic varieties with real numbers or complex numbers, they're normal spaces. And, and, 
and they have this topology that comes from the topology of the complex numbers mm -hmm. and the real numbers, right? The Galois group doesn't act on, doesn't preserve that topology. Mm -hmm. So it's only when you, this is kind of a, yeah. a, not the best discussion for a general interview, but, <laughs> Sorry about that. but it's just to understand, uh, I mean, a lesson from algebraic geometry is to understand things that are defined like in terms of integers, they're best understood by looking at each prime at a time. and looking at mm -hmm. the real completion and you view the information that way, but in these different aspects, it extended. And just the mm -hmm. intersection of all this information gives you the integral information. So each one has a different life. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of sophisticated. And this, this was actually too much for my topological co colleagues. They didn't, Oh, yeah, no, they didn't want to hear about so, this. So I mean, the, the geometric topologists, not the homotopy theorists. Yeah, because the homotopy the theorists loved yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we, we do. <laughs> right, right, right. So, so, so you, you're assembling all this information one prime at a time and the rational information. Right, and together. for manifolds, it's split into the prime two and all the yeah. odd primes. Mm -hmm. didn't, individual odd primes behave the same way. And, it was and very different. Exactly. Because of the... Poincaré duality is like a quadratic form, and it's well known that quadratic forms behave differently at the prime two and at odd primes. Mm, yeah. Can I break in? Yeah. Uh, at this moment, you mentioned Poincaré, and we have this uh, concept of Poincaré moment, yeah. where Poincaré all of a sudden saw something he had worked on for uh, months, and then all of a sudden, he's in the light, he saw the solution. Have you had any sort of Poincaré moments? Well, I search for them all the time, but they come very <laughs> seldom. Uh, but you mentioned... Shall I segue from this discussion or yes. start a new discussion? No, you, you just mentioned this example. Well, I mentioned uh, the, yeah, when you, duality, right, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. I'm thinking about when you were supposed to have your qualifying. Oh, where, oh yeah. yes, right, yes. yeah. So, so you, yeah, at the beginning of the surgery story, which, as I said, is due to Tom, was understanding, uh, uh, this was going back to the qualifying exam to work on the PhD. Mm -hmm. This is back before. Mm -hmm. And there was a little book by Milner called Topology from a Differential Viewpoint. And how uh, you could do all of the usual things that, you know, Konigsberg bridge problem, continuing through Betty numbers, continuing, et cetera, et cetera. You could do that all more geometrically using smooth functions and regular values, take pre-images of nice points and stuff like and sub -manifolds. And uh, that, that was Tom, uh, Milner's beautiful description of the Tom theory from mm -hmm. 1953, mm -hmm. okay? So uh, I was studying that for the orals and I knew it forwards and backwards and uh, could answer any question and so on. And I was walking in and I thought, I better look at it one more time for the exam, I went to the library and opened it up and was looking at it. And it's a short, it's a small book, and it, you know, it's got 10 theorems in it. But still, there's a lot of steps, and uh, I was looking at it one more time, and then this basic picture of when you have a map to something like a sphere, and you take the pr a map of something to a sphere, and you take the pre-image of a point, which is what's called a, a nice value, you get a nice submanifold. It's called the implicit function theorem, and you get local coordinates, and then the neighborhood sort of funnels down, like you would push a slinky down on and flatten it out completely. And then, but this was about saying something about the global map. This is the preimage of one point. But then I noticed, oh wait a minute, preimage of one point has all the information because. The complement may be very complicated in the domain, mm -hmm. but the complement of a disk in the sphere is contractible. It's just the other, if you take a, you know, like you take a point out of a balloon, it goes, psh, right, contracts, right? It's contractible. And so you could extend the mapping to the contractible part uniquely. Any choice you made would be related by deformation to any other choice. And, and, it, and, and suddenly the whole book and the whole theory became clear is just followed from this picture, this slinky picture, with that logical remark that 
complement here is contractible, so there's no more information. That's just pure logic plus this simple picture. Mm -hmm. The whole book fell away. The entire theory fell away. I could just, you could just do amnesia on me if I left that picture in my, I could reproduce the whole book and the whole theory. And then I thought, this is what it means to understand mathematics. I was a graduate student. Fantastic. Yeah, and so I want to feel this again. <laughs> <laughs> and have you? Yes. Have you been able Sometimes to it takes longer and longer. But <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. But, yeah. but uh, of your, of your uh, main result from this era, are there any ones that have such a picture in your mind where you actually see the entire theory? Well, I mean, basically this sequence of steps things I was talking about was you take pre-images and use this picture. Mm -hmm. I keep using it. Yeah. Once you have, the point is when you have a very simple, like, you know how a screwdriver works. Here's this thing, a handle, it goes into the slot and you turn it, <laughs> you take apart this house, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, you can do anything. You have to have a simple tool and use it. And mm -hmm. You have to understand it. And so, well, that was kind of not exactly a prank ray moment. I'm, when I know the prank ray moment I was thinking of when you said that was when he put his foot on the bus and he realized that the holomorphic bijections of the unit disk were the same as the symmetries or congruences of non-Euclidean geometry. Mm -hmm. And that was a fantastic connection. Mm -hmm. And he knew both things, but in, in a sense, the connection is a moment. Yes. Yeah. And yes. so this yeah. sort of but, completely but, dictated the next century, mm -hmm. all the work of Thurston and so yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. But you must have had a, a similar experience. Uh, you, you're saying that in, in, when you prove the Adams conjecture, it's essentially for your future development, it wasn't really important that the Galois, uh, uh, Galois action corresponded to the Adams operations. But still, it must have been very important to you at the time when you were trying to solve the Adams conjecture yeah. that they were the same. That must have been a revelation that that actually could be true. Well, it's, it's, it's not my creation. It was uh, Quillen's observation that somehow the these atoms operations, whatever they are, mm, we've introduced them are. out of context, <laughs> but anyway, some symmetries of something that's related to manifolds in space, which is the tangent bundle, really, um, you know, the tangent directions in a manifold. The symmetries are related to this fact in, uh, that when you're working in the field of algebra where you assume that, say, p times anything is zero, where p is a prime, like three times at the prime three, three times anything is zero. Uh, if you work in that, there's an amazing fact that if you, like if you work where three times something is zero, if you take a number and you cube it, okay, and you take another number, y, and cube it, and if you add the two, and then cube the sum of the two numbers, you get the same thing because the binomial coefficient theorem says you get these one, three, three, one mm. terms, but three is zero, so you get one and one. So it's, that's Fermat's little theorem, mm. right? That shows you have this symmetry. In each of these mm. prime worlds, you have this additional symmetry given by Frobenius, and mm. that's fantastic. And so Quillen had already suggested that there's a relationship between the Adams conjecture and Frobenius but that was a little too exotic for me, and he, I wanted to use it, I didn't want to prove it. And then I heard that, I had, hadn't met him yet, I heard that he wasn't going to work on it because he'd have to learn 200 pages of growth and deke and transfer it into, because he only wrote perfect papers, <laughs> and they had to be perfect or else he didn't write it. So is this Quill Quillen you're talking about? Quillen, yeah, yeah, right, right. And I know, now I'm adding what I knew, found out later as I read more of his work later. Every paper is perfect. It's, it's not only perfect is not the right word, it's optimal. You can't do better. <laughs> right? I mean, All right. Yeah. So uh, I heard about this and I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to pretend it's true because Quillen made this connection, could write the proof out. And then I said, but wait a minute, I can't just pretend it's true. I've got to prove it myself. But if it's mm. true, it's easier to prove because you know it's true. So I'll just, it's a topological theorem. So I'll just keep working on it. I worked on it for six months, which in those times was a really long time. Mm. Things were happening faster. Mm. And 
uh, I reduced it to something. It was equivalent to something, and then there was, and then I tried for a long time to prove this something, find it, and I couldn't do it. And then I remember sitting on the lawn. I remember exactly the moment, August 1967. I'd just driven up from Mexico with my family to Berkeley. I was going to spend two years there, sitting on the lawn of the house where we were staying for a few days until we got our own place. And I said, "Now, what did Quillen say about this?" And I was—I hadn't thought about it. I was thinking about it myself. And he said, oh, the Frobenius algebraic symmetry at the primes. And, uh, and it turned out it gave my condition immediately. Mm -mm. So and I could prove it's true if and only if this condition holds. And then if you just remember what Quillen's ideas was, you get the condition. Amazing. So in some sense, that was a moment. Yeah, it took yeah. a year to write out the details. But they were different details. They were less foreboding than what Quillen had decided, mm. so it was able to do And it. that spawned the MIT notes. Those are the MIT notes. So, so, this so you have to first localize and mm. do all of homotopy theory. Yeah. And this sounds, again, like a Poincaré yeah, moment. It does. Yeah, that's a Poincaré moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But then, it was over like that. Yeah. Mm. But then you move on to, uh, to the quasi-conformal manifolds and the Lipschitz uh, uh, conditions. So, right. so how did that transition, how did that happen? Well, you, you know, sort of skipped about 10 years. But yeah, uh, so, so the rational theory, so we, 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 agree. So, so, so <laughs> we agree that we would skip the rational, which really hurts. Okay. But <laughs> well, no, but I, I'll say one point about yeah. that, because the algebraic geometry and stuff just does the primes. Mm -hmm. And it turns out all the information in this algebraic topology is deter determined at the primes has this extra symmetry in it, which mm -hmm. is related to algebraic geometry. And I thought, well, wait a minute, so what about the infinite prime, the Archimedean place? And uh, I said, well, uh, I mean, I'm, I don't, I, did, I didn't know any analysis or anything like that. But I, said, I said, well, maybe it has to do with differential forms. <laughs> you know, and, and so, and then it turned out it did. And it was it, such an amazing uh, No, but sort of like solved. algebra does this part, analysis and geometry does this part. Yeah, which just opens analysis to all of the rational theory. Right, 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 right. So was, that was that. Was that. That's so a it was, wonderful it was, thing. And you go with, uh, you go then to prove that, in a certain sense, homology in many situations, cohomology in many situations, determines the entire type. Yeah, for, in the that's rational true theory. for these for algebraic Kale, varieties. Kale right, manifolds yeah. and stuff like that. Right. And so it had a nice corollary, yeah. yeah. It was a way of, see, the idea was, you express the information in terms that are natural. Mm -hmm. So it's natural to express the information of the infinite part, mm -hmm. rational numbers, real numbers, in terms of differential forms, which is natural for analysis and geometry. So, so you, you have this variety form on the primes with a Galois action, and you have really analysis on the... On the, the differential forms. And the right. differential forms. Which is related to topology, right. Yeah, the but cost. then to go on, so mm. all of this was frustrating because it was outside the manifold. They were sort of invariants, and the idea, I was like the fact of things inside the manifold. And it turned out foliations or mm. dynamical systems and fractal sets, like we saw this morning, mm -hmm. we had this fractal set. I mean, that, these things are inside a manifold, and they are constructed by infinite processes inside the manifold. And so I started to learn about these infinite processes. And mm -hmm. it was, that began the dynamics part. But it was sort of like just following this interest inside. So there was no logical reason. So, so, so I was starting over as a mm -hmm. graduate student, you might say. So is, is it fair to say that you're moving in this direction? So you're moving through rational theory, formal, uh, formal stuff, and going, having analysis here? And then you're trying to understand, that's what you're saying, the inside of the manifold. And then it turned out the best way to understand dimension two is not through the smooth structure, but in terms of the quasi-conformal structure. Mm. And that's the best way to understand dimension two. And it's amenable to certain infinite fractal processes, like we had this morning mm -hmm. at the school, school kid thing. Uh, and there, you know, and about this time, no, not, not yet. Uh, but anyway, it's, so anyway, you just, it was natural to 
leave this highly sophisticated algebraic viewpoint and go back to the original interest in manifolds mm -hmm. and then dynamics and processes like dynamics inside mm -hmm. the manifold. I mean, physical processes take place in space. Mm -hmm. So this is all about everything else mm -hmm. in science. You know, even it, medicine, your body, it's yeah. got tubes and it, fluids it, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. It, it could be quite uh, maybe an idea to talk a little more about these uh, dynamical systems and their importance in uh, studying manifolds. And I have a very concrete uh, question to you. Uh, so, what's the importance of Michel Armand's and his subsequently his student Yokos? Uh, the answer they gave to the Poincaré question about semi conjugacy of circle diffeomorphism right. without periodic points. Right. So, what's its relevance to renormalization questions? That's one question, and to the universality a la Feigenbaum. Yeah. Uh, and what, uh, 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 finally, in what sense? Uh, was this an eye-opener for you, if that's, if I can use that term? Mm. Uh, well, I mean, let's see. <laughs> it's more like this learning, uh, desire to uh, understand things inside manifolds. Mm -hmm. Before it was outside manifolds. You, you have this nice picture of manifolds being like milk on the, uh, from the outside they look like a puddle of milk, they don't have any Personality. Right, yeah, they don't have any. Yeah, but then, so that's about the theory we've been discussing. But now you want to go back to the idea: why is it interesting to know about manifolds? Well, it's about space. Um, okay, so we've done the number aspect, mm -hmm. but now why is it really interesting? And uh, well, processes, all the processes that we see go on in space. Mm -hmm. So all of that stuff, which is described by various other fields. ODEs, partial differential equations, functional analysis, that's all part of describing the processes. There's also combinatorics, computer algorithms, all that is about processes and time, but these processes and times go on in space. Okay, so uh, I, w I didn't know all that then, but I just, I wanted to know more about things going on inside manifolds. So the, a little dynamical system could create an interesting fractal set inside the manifold. And if you perturb the dynamical system, that fractal set, you know, was still there. Mm -hmm. It was structurally stable. So you sort of had mm -hmm. to learn about things like canter sets that was, <laughs> and, you know, fractals and stuff. And, uh, and uh, so I started and uh, it was kind of a, I would say almost a, 10-year period before I got to the quasi-conformal mappings. Mm, okay. So this to the 90s? Yeah. Well, no, the, to this the, is during the 80s. No, 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 it's from, see, the, we were just talking to the end of the 60s. Exactly. This to <laughs> the end of true. the 70s, and then quasi-conformal mapping started. But it was inside thinking about dynamics, foliations, like mm -hmm. this idea of an onion that's foliated. You know, that's a very that's attractive a picture, and these were interesting objects. And so started thinking that way. And Thurston arrived on the scene. Mm -hmm. He blew everybody's mind away, including mine. And immodestly, I'll say I was smart enough to appreciate I was watching Mozart playing the piano. Mm -hmm. I mean, not everyone did because he wasn't very communicative. But he was one of your heroes along with Tom, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah. Well, no, but he's younger than I. Yeah, exactly. He's my younger brother yeah, here. But you haven't so recognized that. Yeah, right. No, but I <laughs> could see, and, and it fit with this desire of mine to go inside the manifolds and understand more geometric things. So I started, but he was like midway in between the decade that he's, mm -hmm. that, that sort of, that's started studying dynamics. So I learned the Smail School. And then in France, I started going to Michel Hermann's lectures met Yoko's the student, and now Michel Hermann is working on a problem that, well, it happened like this, Don Joie died in 1974. Mm -hmm. and this is like the middle of that decade between, and Michel Hermann was working on his papers for the French Mass Society, and he started talking about the Don Joie argument. So I learned that argument, and then he started answering these questions refining, Don Joie had answered Poincaré's question mm -hmm. to get a homeomorphism. He had a, Poincaré had a, he was doing celestial mechanics and resonances and harmonics and three body problems. He came up with this question 
asked Don Joie. Don Joie only did it a couple of decades after Poincaré died, actually. So the question, he answered it. And then Michel, and this is all about one manifolds, one dimensional mm -hmm. manifolds, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so it turns out they're actually among the hardest from this interior point of view. Mm -hmm. From the interior point of view, they're very difficult, okay? That's, it's, they're the hardest. It's hard, hard so to it's see a pimple on the street. Reverse <laughs> situation. And, and it was very fine and uh, structure of Michel Hermann analyzed and uh, we were learning as he was producing results and this was, I was just intrigued by it. For example, well, I'm just, I don't have time for that, but anyway, it's a beautiful example involving the golden number and Fibonacci numbers that intrigued me. You know. and, and this is while, while you were at IHES. Yeah, mm. I, IHES. Mm. He was at Orsay, which is just a walk mm. across the valley, you know. So go over there. Uh, so we learned, and there's an interesting thing about the line, there are three kinds of distortion that behave algebraically very nicely. There's the metric, the distance distortion, the ratio of distances distortion, and then the cross ratio difference of distortion. So corresponding to metric geometry, affine geometry, and projective geometry. Mm -hmm. So these are, so the, and there's a chain rule, like you learn the, was that what you call it in, the, when, in undergraduate? The chain rule, yep. right? Take the logarithm of that, you get a nice formula for composing. Mm -hmm. And now you could do two other compositions for these higher distortions using and that, those were key things that were sort of explained by, that was the way I was explaining to myself. Michel Hermann's theorem took a whole volume of IHS and I wanted to get it down to something like a moment mm -hmm. thing or a few moments to thing. And you could, after a couple of years, get it down to some things you could tell on the phone to somebody. That was my challenge. I want to tell it on the phone mm -hmm. to somebody. Find a proof I can tell to somebody on the phone. You know, that's me. you have to understand it. To tell mm -hmm. it. You can't write a lot of formulas and calculate stuff. So I got that, and then that was just like this desire to understand, and it was like fun, you know. But then uh, in 82, I heard about this. The physicists had discovered it's something like phase change, you know, when you start, you know it here, you, water gets colder and colder, and suddenly it forms this crystal, mm -hmm. right? All this rigidity happens. Well, that's called a phase change. And there are a lot of situations where that happens in physics. And it turned out they had, physicists had calculated one in a dynamics example, where you adjust a certain parameter to the freezing point, you might say, and then you get this incredible thing. And it's, it could depend on infinitely many parameters, and it doesn't depend on anything at all. It's universal. Mm -hmm. And it could depend on infinitely many parameters. That's like the water. It yeah. could be, you know, it could yeah. be some crazy yeah. thing, right? It's Th not. That, it's that was what Feigenbaum first yeah, this discovered. Is the yeah. Feigenbaum discovered that there was a rate, and then other physicists discovered, and Feigenbaum too, actually, but he, he didn't communicate it as well as the other ones. They found that there was this intrinsic geometry, of the, like a crystal, you might right. say. Right. Now, what was interesting about this for me is that this is, there were no techniques that were available to prove this. It was numerically calculated. Mm -hmm. That meant it's true. It's, you know, you could take a different, you know, take this formula, take that formula, do this infinite process, convert, bingo, to these numbers. The Hausdorff dimension was 0 0.5308, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah. So here's a theorem that's true. It's precisely formulated. True with quotes, because it was numerically true. Mm -hmm. Not, there was, and the available techniques were not there to prove it. Mm -hmm. But it turned out you just had to add two more things to the Michel Hermann Yoko stuff to prove it. So you could prove it. But it took eight years. It took eight years. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But it was yeah. like, the idea was I could stop whatever I'm doing and just work on this. There won't be any counterexamples. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? And, and you were the and one it, that came up with the proof? Yeah, I found it. Yeah. yeah, took eight years. Yeah, and that was eighty two, eighty eight. Ninety. 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 Eighty two. When I heard about it. Ah, so, it took so eight we just years. did two decades. Yeah, yeah, that's. My goodness.
And in the meantime, uh, you've... Uh, in you've the meantime, I was just working yeah, on in this. The meantime, no, no, but you <laughs> certainly did other things that, at the time, and I don't know whether it's part of the project. And well, I don't know, there might be other things that appeared, but I wasn't working on anything else. No, but, else. but for instance, the no wandering domain theorem. No, that's 81. Uh, okay, it was published in 85, and we... we oh, no, 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 was, no, no, that was already over. This field was, I was in quasi normal mappings, I showed that all four bears theory goes into dynamics okay. of the complexes. Yeah. So, so that, so that was already fait accompli. Yeah, yeah, but, that, yeah. So go ahead. but that, that must have been, uh, been uh, very inspirational, that you got this result about the non-wandering set. No, but it was sort of obvious. Well, not for, the, not no, for it was for obvious from the understanding. Yeah, yeah, right. But I mean, Fatou, it was not obvious for Fatou. And no, no, but he right. didn't have this theory of quasi conformal yeah, maps yeah, right. and this no, deformation no. theory. Yeah. But it must have been very satisfactory for you to prove that. Well, no, it's not. No, no. no? You, have, you have misread me. Oh, but, okay. but on the other hand, <laughs> okay. And I mean, these prizes and stuff are nice, but that's not the point. It's not the point to solve a problem, it's the point to understand. Okay. And by this point, by the time you understood what all fours and bears were doing, you just, it was like a Poincaré moment of, you say, this theory here is, could be very useful in this other theory. These and were disjoint the universes, and you could do the Fatu Julia thing as just transfer the technique over. Are you not talking about your dictionary? Yeah, that's the first mm -hmm. entry of the but line of dictionary. I, I, yeah. I never got, so in the paper where you prove the no wandering uh, domain, in their introduction, you state the dictionary. Yeah. Uh, but, okay, so, so this may be just... But that's from 82, 81, 80, 80 81. Yeah, okay. I mean, uh, where it's published and where it... Yeah, exactly, I, I understand that. Yeah, right. But um, you don't use your dictionary in order to prove, say, the no wandering... Uh, no, no, domain. you do. You, you do? You, okay, the tell me. There's something called the all fours finiteness theorem, mm -hmm. and you take what makes that work and you restructure it over in this other domain. I realized that it is sort of audacious to tell you what you did. <laughs> what? Sort of, it's sort no, of no, audacious no, from no, your no, 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 it's just, it was really <laughs> using the comparison, the correspondence. Exactly. So, so the non-wandering, the Fatu theorem is the, the corresponds to a known theorem in this Kleinian group category. It's but, just, the, it's the idea of mm -hmm. understanding not the names and what the field is, but what is the math idea, mm -hmm. sort of. The math idea is the same, mm -hmm. here and here. But, but is this sort of like you were telling us just a moment ago, that once you know that something is true, it's way easier to prove it. Was the dictionary some sort of guidance in that respect? For yeah. you? you knew what would be true? Well, no, I know I didn't. I know, well, well no, the, you, had to, you had to arrange the, it's like you have a party, you have, you have to have enough drinks and enough food. I mean, you have to have enough stuff. You had to make sure it accommodated mm -hmm. the comparison, right? Mm -hmm. There's some statement. Maybe it would be that. In retrospect, at the end, you could say the Fatu problem corresponds to something that was known over here to all fours and pairs. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's just the underlying math is the same. That's yeah. satisfying, but that's. But it was so obvious. It was uh, not exciting. In but that same way. Yeah, it was sort of natural. See, the idea is you think in terms of structures, the structure here and the structure there were the same. Yeah. Two examples of the so, same. So, so we are talking about your dictionary between Kleinian groups and uh, quadratic uh, or uh, complex dynamics, if you like, right? Yeah, this, will, that's, this is an item in the dictionary. And, okay. and for okay. every, it turned, the dictionary says for every item here, there should be a corresponding item here. Okay. Because the basic elements of the two universes are the same. Okay. Mm. Okay. I mean, yeah. In fact, I once introduced bears at a conference to Moscow. Uh -huh. Jokingly, we were both sitting there, and I said, and, and, and uh, the, uh, Mostow's ideas are exactly what are going on here, and bears' idea are what's going on here. I said, why are you introducing us? We've known each other for years. We're close friends. But we never talk math. <laughs> <laughs> like he said it proudly. I said, well, I have this sure. one theorem that if you do this, here's the theorem, if you do this, it's Mostel's theorem, if you do this, it's your theorem. <laughs> <laughs> How did they react to that? Huh? How did mm. they react? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, it's sort of, you know, people are in their comfortable worlds and yeah. it's already rich and beautiful and they're happy there. Yeah. And I'm, 
not like that. I, in fact, when I start to understand something, I start m wanting to move sideways somehow. You know? Fantastic. I mean, yeah, yeah. Great. it's a different. Great. Yeah. So we're making progress. <laughs> Absolutely. But, but okay, so, so you have the dictionary, and what you're telling us is that the underlying, so to say, mathematics of the two things are two. the same. Yeah. And, and, but not for any particular reason, it's just the same, is that also what you're telling us? Because that often, occasionally... Not necessarily what? It, okay, it occasionally happens that you have two different mathematical problems and the way you handle them or the way the combinatorics works is just the same for no apparent reason. No, no, no. That's, That's not what's happening no. here. There, there is no, a it's just, you know, it's sort of like, what are the basic elements that are involved in the mathematics in one situation. Mm -hmm. in, in this case, it was there's a dynamics, which mm -hmm. has a certain form actually, which I won't go into, a te technical form, called hyperfinitness, related to phenomenon algebras. But, and also, it has to do with Riemann's ideas of defor deforming the complex structure. Okay, so mm -hmm. those are the two ideas. So there's, there's an underlying structure the complex structure, it's preserved by the dynamics. These are called holomorphic dynamical systems. So these are both holomorphic dynamical systems. So now there's a field called holomorphic dynamical systems. Mm -hmm. uh, and this technique can be used in the entire field. And, but before there was a field called Fatou-Julia theory and Poincaré limit set and domain of discontinuity and mm -hmm. so on. That was, these were two different fields. This was occupied by complex analysts. This was occupied by, in the modern time, by dynamical systems people. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the basic elements of the underlying s discussions of both cases were the same. Mm -hmm. So every, every advance here should correspond, correspond to, to something mm -hmm. over there. Right. So it's, it's like looking at things in simple terms, without mm -hmm. the words. Like I don't let my graduate student use words. They can't use names. They can't use any proper name. <laughs> they have to say in an English sentence in terms of basic concepts like linear algebra, mm -hmm. their integers, limit points, topology, what the hell they're talking about, okay? And I slap them around if they don't, <laughs> verbally. Very good. You're, you're known to be very, very broad in your interest in mathematics and you see connections that other people haven't seen. But could I ask you sort of a provocative question? Is there some type of mathematics that you don't like? No. You like no, because it's all this one tapestry. Okay. It's all connected, like this tapestry behind you, you know? It goes all around. And, I mean, it's... Oh, but this is and I, I, everything is interesting to me. Okay. Yeah. And then fluid dynamics enters. Yeah. Okay. Can you tell us about that and why? Uh, okay, you have a punchline at the end here. I won't spoil it for you. Oh, I, I forgot. Oh, you forgot. <laughs> oh. oh, you were you promised to replace uh, uh, Newton's calculus by Poincaré's combinatorial topology. Oh, right. Of course. And no, that's dynamic. not a punchline. That's the theme. Yeah. That's okay. Good. Okay. Right, no, no, the idea is, yeah, so quick history of math, right? You had the Greeks, they had their problems, thousands, more than a thousand years go by, Newton comes along in Leibniz, invents the calculus. Suddenly, a bunch of these problems the Greeks had were solved. They could compute volumes and new things, because in calculus you sort of ignore higher order error terms. You have errors of 0.1 decimal place, and then error is 0.001. You ignore those and just try to get the first part. And then the formula is simple, and you get this beautiful theory. Hmm. But you know, if you look a physicist in the eye, they'll say the continuum doesn't exist. <laughs> you have trouble nodding your head. I can see <laughs> yeah. that. You nod lightly, shaking yes. your yeah. head. No. <laughs> the continuum theory. doesn't yeah. exist because yeah. what do we know about? We have the atomic models, the elementary particles. There's no physics below 33 decimal places. There's no physical theory. You can't mm. even talk about the distance below that. Mm. On the other hand, the calculus ideal works beautifully. You have gravity, Einstein's theory. It, by the way, Einstein's theory hasn't been connected to the standard model, which is the way the elementary particles interact, mm. which are at these small distances getting right. down to Planck scale. Right. 
fact, Planck scale is sort of the scale at which gravity and the strong forces of nature are co comparable, mm -hmm. comparable. Mm -hmm. That's the, so, uh, in some sense, this continuum, see, and even the physicists, they use the continuum as if, like in a religious way, it, mm. it exists. And mm. they know it's not true because Newton's calculus leads to classical physics, which is negated by quantum theory. Mm. But they, it's so beautiful, representation theory, Lie groups, it's so beautiful, they, and it, they can make models, and the models work for some, but there's no basis somehow. Mm. There's something missing, right, right, in the physics theory. So, fluid mechanics has been in between a classical and a, and a quantum discussion, you might say, statistical discussion. It's been in between. And in three dimensions, well, because in two dimensions, it's theoretically worked out, but not computationally, but theoretically worked out for the same mathematical reasons these all force bears theories and this deformation theory work. Mm. So, that analysis that's related to that. Yeah. And I understood that. That's one reason I got it. I understand that, I, and half of that theory works in dimension three, but not the other half. Hmm. So I, I was astonished to hear in 91 or two that these basic hydrodynamics equations were not theoretically understood, hmm. whether they had solutions or not, because in dimension two it was all clear cut. I hmm. understood why. Hmm. And uh, it, they're used all over the world by engineers and doctors to f fit aneurysms, uh, you know, they use the little turbulence inside the aneurysm and do a little support thing here. Doctor can 20, do 20 a day and he can fix people up who could die any minute, you yeah. know? So like, how can this not be true? And then I started to work on it. And then also about that same time, it was a one was able to put things on a computer quite well. But still there's a limitation. If you put a thousand grid points, thousand by thousand by thousand, it's a trillion, you calculate, but then there's a matrix problem, which is trillion, a, a thousand by thousand by thousand, a billion, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. You get a billion calculation you can do, but then a matrix problem is a billion by a billion. Mm -hmm. So it's beyond. Mm -hmm. So already there's a definite limitation to what we can compute. So this mathematical problem actually that became one of these millennium problems later, I was already working on it for a decade before, uh, is beautiful, precise, and so on, but it's not practical. What's really important is what can you understand at the scale when you can compute, you know, and then maybe prove theorems too, but you know. And so, now, the idea I had was, well, this is all about space, mm -hmm. process happening in space, and you've got the Newton continuum, which gives you a beautiful algebra, picture of space. You have differential forms, calculus, Leibniz rule, for product, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, great, but it turns out if you discretize the problem to put it on a computer, you've got to do difference quotients instead of derivatives, and they don't satisfy the product rule. That There's an h squared, you can divide by h, there's an h squared error. Mm. Divide by h, there's still an h error. Mm. But let h go to zero, it goes to zero. But so that is in every computation, that error term. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, and they know this, the numerical analysts know this, of course, they know it much better than I do, but they don't have a theoretical way to approach it. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, well, Poincaré told us that for all this topology, all the numbers games that we were talking about before, which is quite deep, uh, has to be done by breaking space up into little chunks and do some combinatorics mm -hmm. with that. So there's some combinatorial topology that allows you to understand the nonlinear aspects, which is a product structure, okay? And uh, so that's been my th theme of understanding, and now I've been working on it for three decades. And I think I'm making progress recently. So, so, so what you're trying <laughs> is to take the discretization that we have to do in order to calculate anything on yeah. the, do fluid dynamics or anything like that, to make that into the main object of study itself. Yeah. You, you want study to understand the, that You space. study the full algebraic topology methods. This is going back to the beginning now. Poincaré duality, mm -hmm. which is an intersection, how things intersect. That's a ring structure. In other words, yeah. these objects in a manifold can be intersected. That gives mm -hmm. a ring structure. 
Do, do you think this uh, Navier-Stoke problem, which is one of the Millennium uh, yeah, Prizes... that's the one I'm talking about. Right, exactly. Yeah. Do you think that's one of the hardest of the Millennium problems? I mean, do you have any feeling about the other... Dif uh, I mean, which one is... Uh, no idea. No idea, okay. In fact, I'm not even concerned with it as a Millennium problem, because, I mean, I'd love to prove it, but, you know, that's not... I would rather understand some variant of it. I would. See, what made this dictionary stuff so interesting in a way, and there were several Fields medals and stuff like that, was because they had these pictures of the Mandelbrot set. Mm. I mean, once a wa waiter, at time, we were working on it, and he said, oh, that's the Mandelbrot set, mm. you know? I mean, everybody knows the Mandelbrot yeah, set, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. There are good computations of the Mandelbrot set. You could zoom in at any scale, and this yeah, gets more yeah, and more complicated, yeah. and it's beautiful. It's like yeah. a... Yeah. fern or something you know and, yeah. you know you go deeper and then it's a new thing you know yeah. Yeah. it's precise yeah. and that has led to many statements as conjectures many half of which became theorems mm -hmm. half of which are still open okay and so it's been a very active field we don't have such good computations for fluids in general okay we don't have enough understanding you can just try it if it works good and if it doesn't work you know bad yeah. Yeah. So, the idea yeah. is to put more kind of uh, conceptual work on the problem. And it's the idea that you said, mm. uh, to I use Poincaré's idea of breaking space up into combinatorial pieces mm -hmm. and seeing how they interact together with the Poincaré duality and put all that as into the computer program that's going to treat the Navier Stokes mm, yeah. I Before we end the interview, I, I would like to talk a little about, you have said several times that simplicity, you stressed simplicity, that yeah. thing. And I, we uh, interviewed Atlas Selberg two years before he died. And one of the things that he stressed very much was the following, and I, I quote him, a direct translation of the Norwegian. I believe that it is the simple things that will survive in mathematics. Oh, yeah. Right. Do you agree with me, that? Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> C'est évident. <laughs> no, because you get like a screwdriver. I mean, you know, it's going to last forever. You yeah. know, it's simple and useful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you... Well, no, but I even think more. The goal of mathematics is to simplify everything. In other words, I think that the complicated things can be simplified. I think you, more you, that... You, you think that? Actually, Selberg mentioned Henry, Hermann Weil as a prime example of a person that could attack a problem and simplify it and solve it. Right, yeah. right, right. No, I think it's a good method. Because there are these fundamental points, like the moment I was describing yes. as a graduate student, yes. that organize everything. And, and they're, not hard, they're not easy to find. Mm -hmm. you know? So what are the central points? Mm. You don't know a priori. Okay. Although you start getting a sense of it, it has to do with the structure. What's the structure of the situation? A little bit Grothendieck like. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I know time is. Yeah, uh, I'm showing his, him the. Is, uh, <laughs> I'm not tired. Okay, okay. No, but, they but are. I, I, I would. And the police comes I, in a moment. I, I, yes, I've I know. I've this trick, you know, that if, uh, if the hours <laughs> late and the mathematician you're talking to is tired. You just ask him a question about what he's doing, yeah. <laughs> and then they start talking, and suddenly they're full of energy again. Yeah, right. Well, I, this is promised to be the last question. Yeah, that I, I, I want, yeah, I think, and then afterwards, I'm going to thank for the interview. So, <laughs> I, I want you to comment. I, I think I, uh, when we had a, a Zoom meeting, I mentioned it. Well, Abel wrote down what is called. Uh, you can call it the philosophy of mathematics. This is from 1828, and I, I, I read now. One should give a problem such a form that it is possible to solve it, something one can always do with any problem. In presenting a problem in this manner, the actual wording of it contains the germ of its solution and shows the route one should take. I have treated several topics in analysis and algebra in this manner, and although I have often posed myself problems that surpass my powers, I have nevertheless attained a great number of general results that have shed a broad light on the nature of these quantities, the knowledge of which is the object of mathematics. Do you have any comment on 
this thing? Yeah. Uh, well, I, yeah, that's the, yeah, the, the, the formulation of the problem is very important. Yeah, I mean, and in fact, a given problem may not be the correct formulation of the problem. I mean, every problem stands, if it's well-defined, it's a defined problem. It could be that there's a slightly different version of the problem, which is more natural and will be successfully solved. You know, mm -hmm. that's, so I'm willing to change the problem, mm -hmm. but you should, I'm, like never he scopes. sounds like he would, uh, he is uh, trying to take the problem as given and put it in its best perspective. I'm also willing to change the problem mm -hmm. slightly mm -hmm. to one that can be solved. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's, but I certainly agree with that. It's, it's the point of view is yeah. important. And we have a lot of, I've, another thing I've noticed since I've been around doing this a long time is that when a subject is sort of complete, you can look backwards, it's like, you know, it's very easy to close the barn door after the horse has escaped, mm. right? And know you should have done it before, but mm. uh, you, when you look at the final story and it's converged, you say, geez, if you had started there, from yeah. here, then it would have been natural to do this and then, and then you would have gotten there very quickly. I mean, mm. Usually there's a simple picture of what has happened. In you know? hindsight. I mean, uh, so you, so that if you, you're in a situation where you don't have that, look for it. Okay. So that's kind of what I'm about. Yes, saying. thank you very much. So then on behalf of the Norwegian Mass Society and the European Mass Society and the two of us, we would thank, like to thank you very much for this most interesting interview. Thank well, you. It was my pleasure, I assure you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.